thank you ma'am uh now we yeah, can me... share your screen sir sure. uh let me go ahead and and share my screen um uh are you able to see the screen yeah no um is yet to be shared yes are you able to see it now yes now we are able to see great uh so thank you thank you uh Amelie, ma'am and uh thank you for the department to uh, for providing me this opportunity to uh, give a short presentation on uh, postgraduate studies and career opportunities so i'll go ahead and and start the presentation so in today's agenda uh, we have a slight introduction i think amali ma'am already gave me a, a very good introduction about me uh, thank you ma'am for that and next i'll go over the post graduate option graduation options after your bachelor's uh, i assume most of you will already be aware of what you have to do but this will uh, this will summarize the options you you have out there after you graduate and then uh, I'll go over the MS in US uh, preparations requirements required for uh, doing the MS in USA. And after that, uh, I'll go over the EV industry in which I am working currently and uh, to, to give you an insight about what the uh, industry holds and, and how your bachelors can be used or uh, will be helpful for getting opportunity in the EV industry. And a little bit about electric cars following that. Uh, I, I guess you guys might have already heard about electric cars coming up and revolutionizing, revolutionizing our uh, transportation industry. And uh, after that, I'll go over my uh, the current company I'm working with. It's, it's a pretty exciting uh, company that's producing electric cars. And there'll be a quick Q&A session after that. So please. Feel free to shout if you have any questions during the presentation uh, and and also contact me uh, if you need something and please feel free to ask questions. All right, uh, so uh, a small introduction about me. Uh, again, Emily Ma'am told me I started my uh, engineering in Valium Engineering College in the Department of ECE. I graduated in 2017. Following that, I did my master's in electrical engineering uh, in 2019. And after during my master's, I got an opportunity to work as an intern in NEO as a software validation associate. That's when I was exposed to uh, the automotive industry. It was my first, uh, uh, first uh, experience with the automotive industry, although I have done uh, quite a research during my master's. And after that, I'm currently working with Lucid Motors as an automotive software validation engineer uh, in, in California. So uh, let's go ahead uh, and see what are the post graduation options you have uh, after you uh, after you're done with your bachelor's. The first one is to do masters in India. Uh, I wouldn't say masters in US is, uh, is way better than India. It's, it's definitely better. But India also has uh, a number of good institutions that provide uh, a good uh, quality higher studies, higher education, like uh, IIT, Bits Pilani, or IIIT, and also SRM and VITs. And uh, I assume, I believe that you have to write Kate uh, to be able to get into these, universi these universities for your master's. Uh, and GATE is, is also based upon the basics of uh, ECE, in which, in, you, which you have learned during your bachelor's. And uh, the next option you guys have is uh, doing a master's in either USA, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. The choice of uh, country totally is, is upon you, like what you have to specialize. Each continent or each country has its own uh advantages uh for instance i would say since i did a, a internship or a, I, I attended the university of 20 in netherlands as a um so as a visiting researcher uh and during which i learned europe is more concentrated towards the uh, research so if you want to do a phd or a, a postdoc after phd and get into the research field uh i would suggest to go for europe than usa uh, because they are more research oriented and then the funding for research in Europe is uh, way higher than what's been done in US. Uh, 
US is uh, mostly industrialized, so uh, you'll get a good uh, opportunity to work in the industry of your interest after your master's. And uh, it's it's also a good place to do uh, uh, research in like PhD or a postdoc, but uh, not as intensive as Europe, I would say. And then also uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada have their own uh, specializations, uh, which you can uh, research research much once uh, you start to get into this uh, higher studies option. The next one will be the on-campus placement. I would definitely uh, recommend you to go for that. Uh, it's it's going to help. It, it's, it'll be a backup plan uh, when you when you get when you have some hurdles during uh, your preparation for masters. Uh, so it's always good to have a fallback when your first uh, choice doesn't work very well. Uh, I also, uh, to be honest, I also uh, got placed in uh, on-campus placement, uh, and it it helped me when. Uh, my US visa was uh, had some issues before I can get it, so I had that as a backup option in case my uh, higher visa issues or, or any issues with admissions or applications, which we will go over in a bit. Then there's also opportunities in core field. Uh, like there are a lot of core companies for ECE in India, like Texas Instruments, AMD, Broadcom, Schneider Electric, uh, Schneider Electric Freescale Semiconductors. And uh, to to be able to get into these companies, you should have a strong uh, core uh, knowledge, uh, mostly on semiconductor devices or or either on communication side, uh, whichever is is uh, of your interest. Uh, and the last option is to do a, a MBA, uh, which I wouldn't recommend uh, right after graduation because it's always good to do an MBA after a year or two of experience uh, because that would give you uh, an idea of what MBA is actually is and uh, which specialization you can have in MBA. MBA is not just a, a course like BE, you just join and they have a curriculum. They also have a lot of streams in MBA and specializations, which you will get an idea only after working for a couple of years in the in the corporate environment. Um, okay, so we will go to the next slide. Uh, Preparation for MS in USA. So uh, I put together the steps uh, which I did uh, in the same order as I said it. Uh, so the initial step before you get an admit for uh, MS is be the first thing you, you guys will get into mind is either GRE or uh, TOEFL. So we need both for uh, doing masters in the United States. And if you are interested in doing masters in Canada, you just need IELTS, uh, which is purely uh, test your English English skills on communication, uh, verbal, uh, and and vocabulary, and, and also grammar. So uh, it, it's it's totally possible to be uh, to self prepare for these tests. Uh, you have to put a lot of efforts if you want to self prepare. There are a lot of online materials out there and, and a lot of YouTube videos which you can refer to if you decide to prepare it by yourself. And also, uh, you can, the another option to prepare for GRE, TOEFL, and IELTS is to take classes online or uh, or in person. Uh, I did uh, my classes in Mania Group because uh, since I did my internship in, in Netherlands during my third year or final year of bachelor's, I didn't have much time for preparing GRE and TOEFL, so I had to take classes to be able to efficiently prepare and uh, and get good admissions in, in the universities. So Mania Group, there's a lot of branches. Uh, I'm not advertising Mania Group here. I'm just giving you an idea of uh, what you can uh, do for getting classes for GRE or TOEFL, but there are a lot of options out there uh, if you want uh, a different if you want a different place to take classes for GRE or TOEFL. Uh, and also, uh, it's it's totally possible, again, it's totally possible to self-prepare for these tests. It's just that it requires a lot of efforts and uh, dedication. And uh, so once you prepare for your GRE, so there are basically two intakes for uh, uh, MS in USA. It's fall and spring, as they call it but it's basically uh, the semester that starts in September, they call it as fall, and the semester that starts in January, they call it as spring. So uh, you can get an admit in either of those. Uh, 
I believe most of you are uh, final years, uh, which means you should have gotten, uh, you should have had your score, GRE and TOEFL score by now to be able to uh, apply for universities for next fall semester. Uh, uh, but still, you can still apply for uh, write a GRE, TOEFL, and then get an admit uh, before the fall semester starts uh, next September. Uh, but you should have to be very careful with the timeline because you have to prepare for visa interviews and uh, you should get a slot. And also currently uh, with the COVID situations, I believe uh, there are very limited amount of visa appointments in, in the US Embassy in Chennai or in any of the US embassies in India. So uh, honestly, I would suggest to go for a fall intake because uh, that's when most of the courses offer their uh, basic level of course. So uh, for instance, if you take any, uh, I did a course on vehicle communication network. Uh, they offer the basic level in, in the fall and then the advanced level will be offered in spring. So in case you take a spring intake, you'll, you'll, end, you'll end up taking courses of more advanced level for which you will uh, miss the basics because that comes in the previous fall semester. So it's always a good idea to join uh, or apply for universities in fall semester uh, as that will give you a good chance to take all the basic courses before you uh, go for advanced courses. And uh, the next step uh, after you decide the intake would be to prepare LOR, SOP and resume. Uh, LOR is letter of recommendation, SOP is statement of purpose like why you want to do masters and why that university, why that uh, specialization or, or why that course in whichever you're getting, you're applying for. Uh, I would suggest uh, get a LOR from uh, from Dr. Uh, Komala Ma'am or uh, Ramesh, Ramesh sir uh, if you want. And also if you decide to uh, work for uh, our next one or two years and then do a, a master's, it's it's okay to get a LOR from your manager uh, on about your performance and, and interest in your in your company. SOP is totally uh, uh, your own statement of purpose. Like you wanna justify the university on why you wanna do uh, why you chose the university, why you uh, want to select that specific field, why you wanna select that uh, department, and. Uh, and, and such thing and why you want to do masters first of all. So uh, these LOR, SOP and resume plays a vital role in, in your application. So there will be a lot of applications for the university and there will be shortlisting to have a, a limited number of students uh, every year or every semester. And uh, these LOR and SOP and your resume uh, is going to be a key role of deciding factor when, when they get your application. So I would suggest have a good uh, LOR and SOP. Could take a good time to prepare for it, and also um, Manian Group also supports for LOR and SOP creation. But the content should be honest and and very uh, short and descriptive. And the next step is to prepare for financial documents. Uh, so uh, there are two options: you can have educational loan or you can have your savings uh, from your parents uh, for masters. And whatever you have, you have to be able to uh, present the documents to the university and also to the US Embassy in order to get your visa. Um, so uh, I would say education loan is the best option, so you don't put a lot of pressure on your parents and you will have the responsibility to pay the loan back once you graduate. And, and that, that's the best option as far as I know, and there are a lot of uh, companies that uh, loan or banks that offer loans for for this purpose. Uh, I took a loan in Credila. It's it's a subsidy of HDFC, but there are also a lot of government uh, banks that offer loans at a better interest rates. So uh, it's it's totally up to you uh, to go for either of the option. Uh, it's it's not. Uh, a rule that you have to take educational loan or the savings. So uh, I know most of the students are already aware of it if they had plans of going to MS, but uh, this is just for students who have uh, have not been exposed to uh, MS in USA option. 
So uh, the next slide is about uh, employment possibilities during and after your master's. So uh, you have done your uh, uh, master's and then you, uh oh, I think I slipped, uh, skipped the slide. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. So uh, after the educational loan, then I'm sorry, I skipped a slide in between and I had to go back. So after you uh, get your financial documents prepared, uh, the next is shortlisting universities. So there are a lot of universities in USA. Uh, you have to go to uh, on which university uh, is good for your uh, field. So since you are from ECE department, you will mostly be focused on electronics, communication or electrical. So I would say uh, do a good research, spend time in finding the university that offers the best course and curriculum for your field of interest. And uh, also, also watch out for deadlines because the universities have a very short deadline for applications. You have to be very careful on that deadlines, and then uh, they also have priority deadlines, which offers you a uh, hand over a lead time over the other applicants who apply later over the time. So please watch out for a deadlines to universities you are interested in and apply on time uh, Do not uh, delay your application to universities as that plays a major role uh, in getting scholarships or fundings if you allow a lower SOP and resume is outstanding. And uh, the next process is a visa application. Make sure you have a thorough documentation of all the required uh, re required documents, so your mark sheet, your transcripts, uh, GRE and TOEFL scorecards, um, and your financial documents, and your LOR, SOP, and resume. And apart from these, you have to be prepared to be able to give your interview physically in person in, in one of the U.S. embassies uh, after you decide which university you are going for and which course you are taking. So the visa applications, as I said, is on appointment basis. So uh, is on appointment basis, and uh, it's very hard to get an appointment uh, for the fall semester because a lot of students will be applying, and then you have to be really uh, prepared, and then you have to plan ahead to get a, get an appointment in in the embassy of your choice. Uh, if you're in Chennai, you can have in Chennai. You have one in Mumbai. You have one in uh, Hyderabad, and then you have one in Delhi. So uh, whatever you select, you should be able to justify why this, why you have chosen a different embassy than your native location, and and uh, also for why are you doing MS MS in US? Why are you pursuing for MS in USA? So uh, after that, uh, once that is done, you go for uh, the visa applications. Uh, once your visa is approved, uh, you book your tickets and then your departure, and then you reach your US university of your choice. And then the universities have an international program uh, for st international students. So that's very helpful. Please feel free to reach out for them if you have any questions or doubts, or if you need any support and transportation for the first time and land in US and how to reach your university. They are very helpful. Uh, and in case if you need something, so please feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions. So each university have their own international programs and services for international students. Uh, OK, so the next after you reach there, you do your master's there. Are, uh, you, you get to choose your specialization. Uh, it's not it's way different from the bachelor uh, bachelors in, in India, so uh, th there will be courses uh, of your. You can take courses of your choice. There will be just three courses per semester. You can uh, you can choose to uh, study whatever course you like. Uh, you don't have restrictions uh, to uh, choose your courses. You also have the options to have a limited number of courses from a different department. Uh, that's totally up to your choice. Nobody is going to force you to take any classes uh, like the universities in in India does. So there is no uh, pre-planned uh, course structure, so it's all up to you. So take your first semester in your in your uh, master's for selecting your specialization, and then uh, with that you can have the following semesters courses selected, and then uh, that'll be very helpful for you to get a job in the field of your interest. 
And uh, so the next is about employment possibilities and uh, during and after uh, MS. So, uh, so you reached your university and then you did your first semester and then you did your second semester. There is a there is a hard coded rule that you cannot work uh, until one year after you reached US. So if you're reaching, for instance, if you're reaching the US in September 2021, uh, you can't start to work until September 2022. You have to take two semesters of classes in order to be able to work uh, legally in, in US. So uh, the options you have to work, you have to work in US are CPD, OPT, and H1B. The first CPD is where you will still be a student, you will attend classes in your university, but you can work part time or full time in a in a company uh, as an internship. And this internship should directly be related to your uh, course of study and uh, it cannot be a, a random job that you find in the market. So you know, for instance, if you're doing electrical engineering and then you have to justify the USCIS, which is United States Customs and Immigration Services, that uh, this the internship or whatever option you have got uh, perfectly matches your uh, courses that you have taken in the past two semesters in the US. And also the second option is co-op, which is called, uh, uh, excuse me, co-op uh, co is called, uh, it is for cooperative education uh, opportunities during your uh, masters. So it is similar to internship, but the benefits of co-op is you get credits for co-op. Uh, so you can use that credits toward your graduation, and then it also helps you. Uh, uh, it also helps you to get a good uh, industrial experience before you graduate, so that that will be very helpful for you to find a job. And this CBD is only for zero to 12 months, not over that. If you do it over, if you do it over 12 months, your OPT will be void. That means you don't get to work uh, three years after you graduate. So uh, also this internship and co-op is very different from what you have done in India. So they, they pay you for internship and co-op. And if you get a job in, in a really good industry with a really good company, uh, you can earn money to uh, pay for your uh, tuition the following semester. So that's a very good opportunity uh, to gain to gain experience and also cover for your tuition expenses the following year of your master's. And the next option is OPD, which is full time after you graduate. So this starts after the day you graduate and you are supposed to find a job within 90 days of your graduation. It's not like you graduate and then you spend some time and then you can find a job. So you really have only a 90 day deadline to find a job. And uh, this job should also be directly related to your masters. So these uh, restrictions by the USCA is ensure that the students don't work at uh, companies that are uh, that are blacklisted or of not a good standard for uh, for the students. And also following that will be your H1B, which will you can apply the company applies for you and then it is offered for six years initially. When you, when you transition from OPD to H1B, uh, you are no more a student. You will lose all your uh, benefits that you can get as a student in the US uh, once you move to H1B. And this has to be applied by your company uh, for initial six years and it also can be extended beyond that, which uh, is out of the scope of this presentation. You will also get to know about that once you start your employment in, in the US. So uh, that's about uh, doing masters in USA, starting from application preparations and, and uh, selecting universities and finally landing here. And also most of you, if you're not aware, what is GRE and TOEFL or IELTS? I totally forgot to mention about that. GRE is nothing but a basic mathematics that you studied between your sixth standard and, and tenth standard in your in your secondary school, and it's just that with more with more pressure emphasis on the analytical skills you have, and also uh, TOEFL and IELTS are just uh, English knowledge tests, English skill tests, which test your uh, spoken, written, and and vocabulary and grammar skills, uh, basically. 
So uh, let's go for the next slide, uh, which is going to be the electric vehicle industry. So uh, most of you uh, have already been exposed to electric vehicle industry or hear about that. And I've seen a couple of uh, companies in India are started to produce electric vehicles and the electric vehicle industry in, in the US is way advanced and, and larger than the Indian electric vehicle industry. Uh, for instance, this graph right here uh, shows how uh, I, most of you would have been aware of the, uh, have you heard about Tesla? So, which is the first electric vehicle company to mass produce electric vehicles for uh, uh, in, in the US. And you can see that they started in uh, their market value have raised multifolds when compared to the traditional IC engines, GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler automobiles. So these three uh, companies, GM, Ford, and FCA, are are the three big trees of automotive industry. They produce IC engines. All of you are aware of IC engines, nothing but internal combustion engines which runs on gasoline, like petrol or diesel. And uh, their market value is it's constant and uh, less than 50 billion. And then the Tesla, which is an electric vehicle industry, they produce really good cars, really exciting cars, and that's of higher quality. And it's also good for the environment, and it's also economical, saving you a lot of money on gas uh, and petrol and diesel. So if you see that the industry is growing, it is skyrocketing at the moment. So it is going to be. Uh, it's quite, it is also going to be the same case in India uh, in the upcoming years. So there will be a, a lot of opportunities in the electric vehicle industry. And uh, most of you might have a thought that uh, automotive is for mechanical. Uh, no, it's definitely not for mechanical. Uh, most of the uh, automotive industry comprises of electrical, electronics and communication, which you will see uh, in a bit in, in this presentation. So also in the US, uh, government is promoting the sales of EV, which uh, which helps the market to grow and then people to uh, move towards uh, green transportation method, which is less harmful for the environment as well. Um, so uh, you know how a traditional car, IC engine car works. It has an engine, it's powered by gas, and then uh, it, it burns the gas and then it produces uh, kinetic energy from gasoline. It also produces a lot of uh, byproducts which are very harmful for the environment like CO2, NOx, uh, which is nitrous oxide, and, and other harmful chemicals. So, uh, but electric cars are nothing but uh, cars that runs purely out of electricity without burning anything and without any harmful byproducts. So uh, there are a lot of types of electric cars. Uh, there's hybrid electric vehicle, which runs, which is powered by both gasoline and uh, batteries. And there is plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which can be, uh, which also have gasoline and, and batteries, but it can be charged by plugging into the grid. And also there is battery electric vehicles, which are purely electric. There's no gasoline and which can charge, which can be charged by the regeneration, regeneration and also uh, uh, plugging into a socket or the grid. So uh, the first I have heard about electric cars uh, is when I was a kid, we have toys which purely runs out of electric cars. And then uh, it, the technology has advanced so fast that the electric cars right now can go for up to 832 kilometers on a single charge. Uh, that's that's a exponential improvement in the electric vehicle technology. So if you can see, these are the basic parts that comprises of electric car. Uh, it has a battery pack. It has uh, it has motors, electric motors, and it will have a inverter because most of you might have already taken the electric machines course, which is offered by the Tripoli department, which talks a lot about motors and uh, uh, and generators. So you know that motors need uh, AC uh, to be able to uh, efficiently produce torque. And uh, in, in order to do that, we need a, a inverter, which converts the DC 
to AC, which then powers the motor uh, and produces torque in a more much efficient way. Uh, and there are a lot of types of motors. There you have uh, in, in permanent magnet motors, uh, induction motors. Uh, I believe you might you have studied uh, all these uh, well and deep during your undergraduate. So that's when uh, that's what shows like why you have to pay more attention to your basics and fundamentals on on your, whatever course you study. So whatever we studied, it directly applies to the industry, and then it it you'll see that uh, whatever you studied is in, in in action in in practical way. So uh, and also all these um, electric motor battery, the DC DC converter, and and the onboard charging, the monitoring the charging, everything is done by controls. That's when uh, the control system plays a major role. So uh, we wouldn't have uh, paid much attention to control systems in the bachelors. Uh, I was in that place uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but I, I felt really bad that uh, control, I didn't do very well in controls because 95% uh, of the car uh, working of the car is based off control systems. So control systems is really uh, um, plays a major role in the automotive industry. And yeah, let's go to the next slide. Uh, what's inside an electric car? I spoke about most of the parts already, but let's go over it in a detail fashion. So there's a battery which is 400 volts to 900 volts. Uh, you know, uh, every day, the everyday uh, you use battery operated uh, machines like your laptops or the mobile phones, which goes up to like 1.5 volts to maximum of uh, 15 to 20 volts of uh, battery voltage. But uh, since to move a car of that size and that weight, we need a large battery, which is going to be 400 volts and 400 volts to 900 volts. And we have electric motors. As I said, it's induction motor, permanent magnet motor. Each of them have their own benefits. Uh, and advantages and disadvantages. Uh, most of you might have studied about both during your uh, undergraduate courses, which it definitely helps uh, when you move to the industry. And then there's inverter, which converts the DC to AC to supply uh, to power up the motor. And uh, there is a DC DC converter. Oh, sorry, there is DC DC converter uh, to power up the 12 volt system. For instance, uh, you know, in uh, in the traditional life scenes in car, if a car dies and it doesn't charge, you jump the 12 volt batteries with uh, jumpers, and once the car, once the engine starts, it has the generator which uh, charges the 12 volt batteries to be able to start your car the next time uh, you turn it on. Uh, but in electric cars, since we don't have an engine which generates electricity, we should have a way to charge the 12 volt batteries. So that's when the DC DC converter comes into play. It converts, uh, it steps down the 900 volts to 14 volts to be able to charge the low voltage systems. The little battery that you see in front of the car, in front of your car, uh, I see in car. And uh, about the modern electric vehicles have about 75 ECUs. ECUs are electronic control units. Uh, it, there are uh, 75 ECUs. There are a lot of domains that are controlled by ECUs. You need ECU controls for vehicle dynamics. You need ECU controls for body controls, which is like you open the door. You have a key fob, it detects your key fob. You have an infotainment system, which uh, you, you play uh, music or you have your navigation, Apple, Apple Car, Apple, uh, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. And also you have the autonomous driving system, which are which is also a very big industry nowadays. A lot of research and a lot of money is being pumped into the auto automotive autonomous driving systems, uh, which also needs a lot of controls to be implemented to be able to get a car drive by itself. And then we need the wiring harness, which is like the nervous system of electric cars or any any cars, uh, which excuse me, which uh, makes sure that the 75 or plus ECUs can communicate with each other to be able to operate a vehicle in a desired fashion. To put it in a perspective, uh, uh, the wiring harness is uh, has the largest weight of uh, components in the car. 
So if you stretch a wiring harness of a modern day electric car along, uh, it, it goes up to like four kilometers of length. To put in a perspective, uh, if you take a car uh, 50 years back and then you check the wiring harness, it's going to be just a few meters long. So the wiring harness plays a major role in in, in the electric cars. And then in order to be able to reduce it, uh, reduce the size of the electric harness, uh, the wiring harness, we need to be uh, and we need to be able to have a better communication system, which uh, takes us to the next slide, which is how can they hold up? So uh, if you see, I said that a lot of ECUs distributed, these little dots in this picture are ECUs in the car. Uh, you can see how many ECUs and how complex this uh, uh, communication is. And then we have to be, be we have to be able to have them connected uh, to be able to drive the car. And in order to do that, we have a lot of uh, communication uh, protocols for automotive, which uh, we might not be, uh, which may, we may not be aware of during our bachelors, because uh, our bachelors mostly talks about very basics and fundamentals of uh, communication protocols. And uh, I learned about all these during my masters. So my specialization in masters was uh, was intra vehicle communication protocols. So I did a research on all the intra vehicle communication protocols, and then uh, I, I I got a comparison of how uh, all these works. And then in my job, I, I, I I'm able to suggest like which network can be used for which features uh, in specific in the car. So uh, these are the protocols available at this time in, uh, for the intra vehicle communication can is called controller area network which is similar to LAN, but it's just has a, a two wired physical layer. You know, uh, you might be well aware of the OSI layers that are uh, in the communication architecture, communication protocol stack, and then CAN has a two wired physical layer. Uh, that means you can just have two wires to communicate between two ECUs, which reduces the cost and weight and uh, cost and weight of a uh, electric car. And then there is LIN, which is uh, a local interconnect network. It has a uh, very less speed. It just has a single wire communication. And then uh, it, 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 since it's a less speed, it's very cost effective when compared to CAN and other, uh, other automotive communication protocols. You can see in the graph right there, uh, which gives uh, all the communication protocols for the cost per node and then the data rate they offer. Uh, you, can, you can see LIN is the most uh, cost effective uh, communication protocol, but it offers only 20k data rate. Um, so the modern electric cars uh, generates about uh, one gigabytes of data every 10 minutes of operation. So uh, again, to put that in perspective, you might have uh, you guys will be uh, using one GB of data per day. And then when compared to that, uh, these cars generate one gigabytes of data every 10 minutes of operation. So in order to be able to efficiently distribute the data and then make sure that the ECUs communicate, we have to have a more robust and uh, faster communication protocols and physical layers, which is most robust to the uh, very harsh automotive environments since you have high EMI and EMC interference in automotive uh, environment. You drive in a very high speed, you go, go over bumps, you drive in uh, extreme temperatures, you have a lot of humidity, and then there is no control over moisture. Uh, so we might ha we have to be able to overcome all these uh, harsh uh, communication environment. So these protocols have been designed in a way that they can withstand such uh, uh, harsh, environment, harsh environment and will be more robust to the noises on the automotive uh, environment. So the next is a flex ray and most flex ray is uh, it gives about 10 megabits per second of speed. Uh, and this is uh, very expensive and it's being used on, on and being only used by specific automakers like BMW and Audi and uh, luxury vehicles. And then the, then the next comes most, uh, which is for uh, an infotainment system. It provides up to 100 megabits of uh, 100 megabits per second of uh, communication speed, and this is used uh, purely for the infotainment system to be able to stream uh, videos or music. 
uh, throughout the uh, throughout your electric vehicle. And then the latest and most advanced uh, yeah, technology is automotive Ethernet. You have uh, most of you will be aware of how uh, Ethernet protocol works. So we uh, what they did was they took the Ethernet protocol, they made some changes to the protocol stack and also the physical layer so that the Ethernet becomes more robust to the uh, EMI and EMC interference. So in every you, you use Ethernet in everyday uh, applications like you plug into a, a, a plug in your PC to the Internet using a LAN cable, you have your Wi-Fi, which is wireless. We don't have wireless yet. But you'll see about that in the next slide. Uh, you use wired Internet, uh, your lab PCs are wired Internet. And if, when you use your PCs at home or in your office or in your lab, there is not much interference. You don't have moisture, you don't have humidity on the on the wires. And you have seen it has the Ethernet wires is so thick and it's so heavy and it is uh, not suitable for uh, automotive environment. So what they did, they took the Ethernet protocol, they modified the stack, uh, communication stack, and then they modified the physical layer of the Ethernet so that they just need two wires to communicate, but still they might they are able to give you a speed of one gigabits per second. Uh, this is the most advanced communication protocol uh, that is present and it's not been uh, it's not mo used in most of the companies it's only in few of the companies that do a uh, very intensive research on automotive uh, communication protocols so uh, this uh, automotive ethernet gives a speed of about 1 gigabits per second that's very useful for uh, the modern electric cars to be able to talk and then it's also relatively expensive uh, than the other communication protocols but since the amount of data that's being produced by the cars is huge, we need a protocol that's faster. So we, most of the people who design cars or the companies that are coming up uses the Ethernet automotive Ethernet as their communication. So I said there is no wireless uh, within the vehicle, but there is inter-vehicle communication protocols, which is uh, which is also a very huge research uh, area and a lot of opportunities in this field as well. So it, it works based on the IEEE 802.11p uh, protocol. IEEE 802.11 is the centralized WAN uh, wireless area network uh, standard. And then the, with the uh, IEEE 802.11p is for uh, the wireless access in vehicle and environment. They call it the WAVE standard. Uh, it works in the 5.9 gigahertz and then it's uh, a 75 megahertz of bandwidth. And uh, it's very useful. It's 300. It, it cover. It gives it 300 meters of range, so the communicate uh, the vehicles can share this data information, like uh, the vehicle speed. Uh, if if if, it, if there's a cross section, you will know a vehicle is approaching the cross section even before you see the vehicle. So that way, your vehicle will be aware of the other vehicles on on the on the road, and that helps us prevent a lot of accidents. Uh, it's been uh, there is a research that's been done by the uh, U.S. government that says uh, with this protocol in place we can save about uh, 615,000 crashes per year just by using vehicle to vehicle communication protocol. That's done by the uh, NHTSA, it's National Highway and Transportation Authority in, in the USA, and uh, this is also a, a budding field in the automotive industry, which uh, most of you might not be aware of. And uh, there's a lot of research going on, and there are very few companies uh, or, or automakers have this protocol implemented in their car. Uh, and then there are a lot of companies who are still behind to catch up with this. Uh, so yeah, so all these uh, intervehicle communication protocols and intravehicle communication protocols involves a lot of basics that I studied during my bachelor's, like uh, you know uh, the encoding, uh, encoding of the signal, the physical layer, uh, using the wireless uh, radio antennas, which gives the physical layers. So uh, we have to be very uh, careful and and proficient with our basics and fundamentals that we learn bachelor's. Uh, although it might not seem boring and you might not be interested at this time, but it's it's really useful once you get into the industry or when you get when you go to do your masters. And uh, so this is the company I'm currently working with. It's called Lucid Motors. 
they produce uh, electric cars they have uh, it gives about 832 kilometers of range in a single charge as i said before and then it takes off uh, from 0 to 100 km per hour speed in less than 2.5 seconds and then uh, there is charging which you can get of 400 km in just 20 minutes of charging it's faster uh, it's it's like charging a oneplus phone which gives a day's power in half an hour that's what they advertise and then this car is capable of charging 20 minutes in uh, 300 miles in 20 minutes i'm sorry no so it has 180 horsepower which is purely electric and generated by the batteries and electric motors. Uh, and then to give you a perspective, the world's fastest car can do a zero to 60 in, in about 2.5 seconds. And it has just two seats. Most of you will be aware of it's called Bugatti Chiron and it, will, it can hold only two passengers. But this car uh, is a standard road legal sedan sedan which can seat up to five uh, passengers and still do a zero to 60 or zero to 100 in 2.5 seconds so uh, you'll be wondering how our actual battery pack will look in the car so this is how it looks it it sits on the floor of the car and these are basically a module so if you see on the right picture you'll see uh, each module in the battery pack each of them have a cells that are similar to our double A size batteries. They uh, connect them in series and parallel to get the 900 voltage architecture. Uh, so they are just basically cells that are uh, that we use in every day, not like actual cells with some few modifications to this uh, to the electrical uh, specs of those cells. And uh, it sits on the bottom uh, body of the uh, bottom of the car. It gives a good center of gravity since it's so heavy. Each battery pack weighs about 1,000 uh, kilograms, and uh, they sit on the body of the car. Since the center of gravity is low, you get a good stability at high speeds, and there is a very less a very less risk of rollover in case you run into an accident or something. So uh, this is the motor, electric motor that drives the uh, uh, wheels. Uh, if you, you can see uh, you, it has the stator, it has the rotor, and it has the cooling manifold. Uh, one important thing I would like to a thing I would like to uh, share is uh, you might have been using your phone if you use a phone or laptop for a while, and then you'll see how hot they become, and then uh, uh, and, and there are phones which get so much hard that you barely can hold it in your hands so that is with just 1.5 volts and 3000 milliamp hour battery and uh, this is 113 kilowatt hour battery and then you can just imagine how much thermal uh, thermal release it has like how hot it becomes drawing current of up to 1200 amps so we need an efficient cooling that cools down the motor and also the battery so that the car doesn't blow up when you go at high speed. And in order to do that, you need to have a efficient and intelligent control system, uh, which uh, senses the e heat and then uh, regulates the coolant flow so that the motor and the uh, battery doesn't burn out. Also, uh, the fun fact about this is all these control systems control the battery, motor, cooling, body functions, and the infotainment system. Everything is designed just using Simulink and MATLAB. So they do the they go for a model based approach where they can gen generate models in the Simulink, and then the MATLAB converts the Simulink model to a C code that will be flashed into the microcontroller unit, and it should be able to uh, do whatever the model is designed for. So uh, they everything again going for the basics. You need to have MATLAB and Simulink to work in this industry, which 95% uh, of the software development is done in MATLAB and Simulink, and the rest 5% is the C code generation, C++ code generation, and uh, Python code for validation. We need to do a lot of validation before we actually release the car to the public because there's a lot of opportunities uh, to get electrocuted and to do for the motor and the batteries to burn out or blow up at high speeds so in order to be able to control all the uh, all the uh, limit, limit all the power output and to avoid any mishaps we need to have a good control system in place that uh, monitors the state of the motors and battery 
and still be able to deliver a uh, high speed uh, requested by the passenger or the driver. So this is how the uh, entire drive train look drive train looks. Uh, this is the battery pack I show and then there are two motors that sits uh, in, in the front and the back that drives the front and rear wheels. So in a traditional uh, IC engine car, if you open the hood, you'll see a huge engine and uh, that's what drives the car. But uh, in an electric car, the body sits on the skateboard and then you will have a lot of trunk and trunk space. Trunk is nothing but front trunk. So you will have a huge space in the when you open the hood of the car. So you can have a lot of uh, storage in the front and also in the trunk. Since the entire drivetrain is miniaturized, uh, there is no need for huge engines and gas tanks to store your uh, petrol or diesel in the car. Everything is just miniaturized to this little skateboard on top of which the body sits. So you will have a good uh, interior space and the front and trunk. So a lot of research is again went into the uh, into this to make the drivetrain this simple and miniaturized when compared to the traditional IC engine cars. So uh, we also have the autonomous driving uh, autonomous driving in place, which is uh, works on 32 sensors. It has high resolution lidars, uh, lidars, and radars, and uh, cameras, and ultrasonic sensors. So all these. Oh, I think I'm going over the time, and it's I'll I'm about to complete, and it's going to be two or three more slides. So. Sorry to take up your Q&A uh, session. So the, uh, since we have 32 sensors, the data produced by these sensors is so huge. As I said, uh, one GB of data every 10 minutes of operation. So we need to have a better communication protocol to be able to handle all the loads. All right, uh, that wraps my presentation. And then a few things I would like to share with you is please uh, have at least one programming language. Uh, be proficient in it. It can be any language of your choice. You can have it a Python, C, C Sharp, C++, Java, it's up to you. I know we are ECE, uh, ECE department, but having one programming language will help you along a big time in your industry and career. And always MATLAB and Simulink, don't underestimate them. It will be boring, but uh, trust me, uh, MATLAB and Simulink uh, plays a major role in the automotive industry. And also, uh, don't try to study and try to learn stuff so that in the in, when you're masters, whatever you learned in your bachelor's will be very helpful during your master's and also in your career. And another thing is uh, please brush up your basics every often. So don't forget whatever you did in semiconductors because it will haunt you when you go to your uh, first job or do your master's. Uh, and so please keep your basics brushed up. And then the last thing I would like to say is build your LinkedIn profile, have a good LinkedIn profile. So do a lot of professional networking. So that way you'll be able to know what's uh, trending in the technology side. Uh, and you will also be able to uh, present this to a, present yourself in a better way to a professor or uh, a professor in a foreign university or, uh, or for your career opportunities as well. With that said, I'd like to wrap up my uh, presentation. Uh, scan this QR code to get my Gmail or phone number. I also have my LinkedIn uh, link to that. Please feel free to connect and ask questions. If you have any, please feel free to follow up. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, spending an hour of your Saturday morning uh, in my presentation. I know it's hard to sit in a presentation for uh, this long. I'm sorry, I, I tried to make it shorter, but uh, that's a lot of stuff I said. So if you have any questions, please shout or uh, ma'am, I'm, I'm done with my presentation. Uh, anybody there? Thank you, thank you, Shaja. Okay, um, you're welcome. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, later on if you have any questions or if you need any guidance or support. I'll be happy to help. Uh, and thank you all again. Students? Uh, sir? Do you have any questions? So actually, uh, one participant, uh, Mr. A. Pondian, sir, is having your own question, sir. Sure. So, which has more torque, electric or uh, diesel engine? Uh, definitely, it's electric uh, motors have more torque because uh, the induction motors 
can produce a lot, lot of torque in a very short amount of time. The pickup is way faster than the gasoline engines. And also uh, it, is, uh, it, it is done in a very environment friendly way, not by burning a lot of gas uh, or petrol or, or diesel. So it's definitely the electric motors. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more mm -hmm. question is, how do work, how do brakes works on an electric car? So uh, the electric car have a intelligent braking unit, which is called IBU. Uh, this takes your pedal uh, movement as an analog signal, and then the entire braking is done by uh, the software controlling uh, a very sophisticated uh, solenoid uh, architecture. So it's not like a traditional vehicle where you have to push the pedal in order to stop the uh, car. You can just uh, give it a little push to the pedal and then it will sense that you need to brake this much and then it will uh, stop the car. So since these cars go in a very high speed, we need to have a, a good intelligent braking system that takes over your uh, brake signal and then converts them into uh, physical traction force to stop the car. Did that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any more questions? Students, any other questions? Hello, Anna. Hello. Yeah, uh, I can. Anna, uh, uh, I'm Deepan Raj from uh, third year. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, uh, Tesla is having a very good uh, charging network across uh, North America and uh, Europe. But mm -hmm. uh, many other manufacturers, they can also use uh, the same charging network uh, because uh, Tesla is uh, open and uh, they are allowing other cars, or the other manufacturers to use them. But uh, why are not, uh, why other manufacturers are not uh, using the available uh, charging network? No? So uh, very good question. So Tesla has a proprietary charging solution for their uh, high speed DC charging. Uh, so in order for other cars to be able to use the Tesla charging network, uh, they need a converter that converts the charging plug uh, from Tesla's proprietary charging design to a standard char electric car charging uh, charging port. So it's like uh, OnePlus, for instance, to compare it uh, with a phone, if OnePlus or Samsung is offering a very good charging solution, in order to be able to uh, use the USB type C on a normal USB type B connector or a micro USB connector, you need to have a converter that converts the uh, type C to uh, type a micro USB or mini USB. So that way uh, we, the other manufacturers have to provide a converter to be able to use the Tesla supercharging network. And the problem with this converter is since uh, the charging happens over like 300 amps or 400 amps, that's a lot of current. And you also you you are aware of the fact that uh, the power is equal to I square R. That means the larger the current, the uh, the larger the loss. So it will generate a lot of heat, and there's a possibility of the converter being melted or or catching fire when you're charging it. So other manufacturers prefer not to use Tesla's charging network, but it's always possible to use Tesla's charging network by using a converter or adapter for the charge charge plug. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Subhash mm -hmm. from final year. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we are uh, using uh, electric vehicles only for uh, cars, bikes, and all nowadays. But uh, is mm -hmm. it possible or feasible uh, for heavy vehicles too? Because uh, for heavy vehicles, we use uh, generally use for fossil fuels so that they can get the power and uh, the pulling capacity for so much of load, but is it possible for electric vehicles to carry so much load? Yes, uh, so that is also a, a good question again. So uh, I believe I have you followed Tesla before? Uh, like, are you following Tesla at all? Uh, I don't know no. who asked the question. Okay, so Tesla is in the process of uh, is, is researching uh, a truck, a semi truck, which completely operates off uh, batteries. It is possible to pull a lot of load with uh, electric batteries because since electric motors are so powerful and then you'll get a lot of torque out of them, it's easy to pull a lot of load. 
the only thing they are researching right now is to how to extend the range over uh, along uh, with a lot of load on it. So it is absolutely possible to have a pickup truck or a semi truck, semi truck, or uh, or any heavy duty vehicles on electric motors because uh, the the they have uh, commercialized the uh, drivetrain, which to convert the bad DC energy to AC and then produce a lot of torque have been uh, commercialized. So it's easy to produce a lot of torque for such heavy vehicles. So it's definitely possible, and Tesla is in the process of producing a uh, uh, electric truck, semi-truck, uh, that will be released soon. If if you guys are very much interested, please go on to YouTube and then search for Battery Day. That's an event uh, by Tesla that's, that's live, was casted on YouTube. So that will give you a lot of insight about how the electric battery technology have been developed so far in, in the past and then what's at the current state and what are the future and how can they change the cell chemistry to get uh, the maximum uh, power output from a less uh, less sized cell. That they call it as energy density, like how much energy can you get from a specific volume of electric cells. So please feel free to wa uh, watch that on YouTube. It's it's very useful and it's very informative as well. Is there any other questions? I think I'm way over my uh, one hour presentation. Any other queries from students? No, ma'am. Thank you for the session. Rakesh? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, you have uh, you given very uh, long avenues for students, uh, starting from yeah. basics, what are all the things they can do in uh, electronics and uh, even in communication and semiconductors. Mm. You have briefed out everything. Very nice. All the mm -hmm. best for you. Uh, you then uh, I have one question. Apart sure. from good SOP for students to get mm -hmm. into higher ed education there in US, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is the score or the GRE score uh, they can have at least uh, to get into good universities there? Uh, uh, yes. uh, how, uh, um, because uh, out of 340, at least mm -hmm. what score they should have uh, to mm -hmm. get into good universities uh, there or it uh, varies according to that of the universities we choose. Uh, uh, this yes, is... Uh, yeah. Uh, this sorry. I think... Uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, what is the score, minimum score or a go a score they have to get in a GRE for getting okay. into good universities there? Sure. Uh, so GRE is out of 340, like you said, and then it's always good yes. to have a GRE score about 300 in order to get in a good university. But uh, yes. in order, if you want to get into the Ivy League or uh, top 20 or 50 universities in the US, you have to have a GRE yes. score about 320 uh, and then oh. a 160 on your math quants uh, for sure to be getting to be able to get into universities. OK, OK, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. All You're the welcome. best for you. Best wishes. Pa. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Good presentation, uh, Rakesh. All the best. Congratulations for your bright future. Sorry. Thank you again, man. Sorry, I was in mute. I didn't. I didn't notice that. Uh, Rakesh, I'm Ramesh. Yes, sir. Uh, I can uh, thank you. I can thank you for uh, your uh, uh, wonderful presentation. Even sure. our students may inspire uh, mm -hmm. about your uh, graduation and post graduation and then working mm -hmm. industry also because all are in same line because your uh, undergraduation provided the fundas. From the fundas, you extended the master, then specialized. Then based on the specialized, you opted or even uh, you got the right opportunities uh, in the core domain uh, in, in, with, uh, with uh, lucid motors. Yes, even uh, my personal point of view, uh, I can uh, appreciate you. Even uh, mm -hmm. students also may inspire. Uh, 
even you mention while presenting your presentation you made mm-hmm. the loan for your master even while yes, talking sir. with you 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 made that uh, uh, credit also like as a debit mm-hmm. uh, so you paid entire loan that's one of the right example so i can admire uh, and i can appreciate your progress and uh, growth it will go along stay safe and take care yeah. wherever you goes thank you thank you thank you very much sir thank you everyone for uh, spending your time to attend my lecture or seminar all right have a good weekend and thank you sir good, good luck for your future uh, ma'am shall we wind up ma'am should ma'am yes yes sir uh, okay uh, so first of all i really thank our management uh, principal sir hod ma'am for giving permission to conduct this uh, event and next uh, thank you mr rakesh raja sir for accepting our request and uh, mm-hmm. deliver a seminar on higher education and uh, career guidance mm-hmm. okay, uh, actually uh, he delivered uh, topics uh, like a uh, preparation for ms in abroad and about gre toefl and university admission t- interns and electrical vehicle industries and detailed explanation about the components of electric cars and working of electric cars okay. so really thank you sir and your mm-hmm. speech gives a idea for students those who are going to pursue higher education and also uh, they will know about uh, what is electric car and what is the working of the electric cars and the intra vehicle communication protocols and all so really mm-hmm. uh, thanks a lot sir so thanks yeah. amali ma'am and thanks ramesh sir uh, for uh, introducing uh, mr rakesh sir a wonderful uh, uh, person thanks a lot sir thank you thank you everyone again and have a nice day thank you thank you thank you, okay, sir. thank you. Uh, thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you very much everyone uh, thanks ramesh sir uh, thank you naraj sir thank you students uh, for meeting our uh, senior and inspired some extent Thank you.